COVID-19 has emphasised to us how much we rely on the web and on social media and how vital it is to see firms applying the duty of care that has been discussed this afternoon to their users as soon as possible. Platforms can and must do more to protect those users, in particular children, from the worst of the internet, which is sadly all too common today. The government will ensure that they set out clearly what legal content is acceptable on their platforms and ensure via a powerful and independent regulator that they enforce that consistently and effectively. Codes of practice will set out what is acceptable for he from hate crime to eating disorders so that it is no longer the networks themselves making the rules. So I pay tribute uh, to the many fine contributions uh, that we've heard today, but in particular to the work uh, of the member for Kenilworth and Southern himself uh, as Secretary of State responsible for the White Paper. And I want to reassure him that the government's forthcoming online harms legislation will establish that du new duty of care, that platforms will be held to account for the content that appears on their services, and it will establish a systemic approach that is resilient in the face of a host of challenges from online bullying to predatory behaviour. Early this year, as he mentioned, we published the initial response, making clear the direction of travel. We will publish the full government response to the online harms white paper this year. We will set out further details on our proposals and we will publish alongside that interim voluntary codes of practice on terrorist content and child, exploitation, child sexual exploitation and abuse. The full government response will be followed by legislation which will be ready early next year. And I know that there is huge concern about the time this is taking, but we also all know that it is critical we get this right and we will do that early in the new year. COVID emphasises the need to get on with this. And we want to introduce effective legislation that makes platforms more responsible for the safety of their users and underpins the continued growth of the digital sector. Because as he said, responsible business is good for business. The White Paper also set out the prevalence of illegal content and activity online with a particular focus on the most serious of those offences, namely child sexual exploitation and abuse. Protecting children online from CSEA is crucial. Alongside the full government response, we will publish interim codes on tackling the use of the internet by terrorists and those engaged in child sexual abuse and exploitation. We want to ensure that companies take action now to tackle content that threatens our national security and the physical safety of children, and that is what we will do. Madam Deputy Speaker, I am sure many members here today have known someone or may themselves have been the target of online abuse. We've heard powerful stories. Close to half of the adults in the UK say they have seen hateful content online in the past year. And I want to make clear today that online abuse targeted towards anyone is unacceptable. Just as in so many other areas, what is illegal online should what is illegal offline is also illegal online and online abuse can have a huge impact on people's lives and it's often targeted at the most vulnerable in our society our approach to tackling online harms will support more users to participate in online discussions by reducing the risk of bullying or by being attacked on the basis of their identity all in-scope companies will be expected to tackle illegal content and activity, including offences targeted at users, users on the basis of their sex, and to have effective systems in place to deal with such content. My department is working closely with the Law Commission, who are leading a review of the law related to abusive and offensive online communications, and who will issue final recommendations in 2021, which we will carefully consider. It's important, though, to note that the aim of this regime is not to tackle individual pieces of content. We won't prevent adults from accessing or posting legal content, nor require companies to remove specific pieces of legal content. Instead, the regulatory regime will be focused on the systems and processes implemented by companies to address harmful content. That is why it will, be more, it will have the extensive effect that so many members have called for today. I want to deal briefly with anti-vaccination content as well. I know that many members are concerned about that, as we have heard today. As the Prime Minister made clear in the House yesterday, as we move into the next phase of vaccine rollout, we secured a major commitment from Facebook, Twitter and Google to the principle that no company should profit or promote any anti-vaccine disinformation and it will respond to flagged content 
more swiftly. The platforms have also agreed to work with health authorities to promote scientifically accurate messages and will continue to engage with them. We know that anti-vaccination content could cost lives and we will not uh, we do anything that could allow it to proliferate. And we will also, of course, work on the media literacy strategy that we have worked uh, on and will, uh, to allow people to better understand what they see online. To address two points briefly uh, that were raised in the debate uh, on product safety, the Office for Product Safety and Standards has a clear remit to lead the government's efforts to tackle the sale of unsafe goods online, and my officials are working with counterparts in other departments to deliver a coherent pro-innovation approach to governing digital technologies, and they will continue to do so. On the IWF, uh, the Home Office is engaging with the IWF, uh, including on funding. Um, and on age verification, the government is committed to ensuring children are protected from accessing inappropriate, harmful content online, and this includes online pornography. Uh, the judicial review that my honourable friend mentioned prevents me from saying more, but the Queen's speech on the 19th of December included a commitment to improve internet safety for all to make the UK the safest place in the world to go online. Madam Deputy Speaker, tackling online harms is a key priority for this government to make the internet a safer place for all of us. I'll close by reiterating how vital it is that we get this legislation right. This government will not shy away from ensuring that we do, and that we do so quickly. Jeremy Wright. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, may I thank warmly all members who've contributed to this debate and congratulate all of them for saying so much in so little time. And it, I hope uh, that we have come together this afternoon to send a clear message on how much support there is across this chamber for not just identifying the problem of online harms, but identifying the solutions. I'm grateful to my honourable friend, the Minister, for what he has said this afternoon. I'm even more grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker, for what I know he's going to say after this debate to his colleagues in government. I don't doubt for a moment his personal commitment to this agenda, but I hope that he will be able to say to others in government that there's probably never been a piece of legislation more eagerly anticipated by everyone on all sides of this House. And although this government will not get a blank check on this legislation, no government could and no government should, it will get a commitment, I think, from all sides to a proper analysis and a proper uh, supporting uh, examination of how we might do this effectively. And I hope that with that encouragement, he will make sure that this happens very soon. Thank you. The question is, on the, is as on the order papers. May I have that opinion say aye? Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, moving very swiftly, I'm going to suspend the House for two minutes in order to do the necessary. Uh, only two minutes because time is of the essence. Order.
Order. We now come to the general debate on International Men's Day. Ben Bradley to move. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that this House should consider the challenges faced by men and boys across our United Kingdom today on International Men's Day. And I'd like to thank the Backbench Business Committee for their consideration, for allocating time today to consider this in the House. But on the day itself, the 19th of November, I'd also like to thank my honourable friend, the member for Shipley, for his work in co-sponsoring the debate, as well as those across the House who have supported it. And I've drastically shortened my contribution as our three hours have become one, which is perhaps indicative of a problem uh, of men's issues being pushed off the end of the agenda, uh, kind of nicely typifies uh, the, the problem. And I want to give as much time uh, to colleagues as I can. Uh, but in these challenging times, it's hugely important that we have this conversation. It's difficult because of COVID and particularly because of the economic impact. When we know there were huge spikes in male suicide and depression following the 2008 economic crash due to losing employment, struggling to provide for families, struggling to find purpose. It's challenging also because of the general discourse that so often seems to pervade our society that talks of male privilege, of toxic masculinity, and of men as oppressors rather than positive contributors or role models. Men are talked about all too often as a problem that must be rectified. Too often the constant drive for equality and diversity seeks to drag others down rather than lift everyone up. I spoke in Westminster Hall just a few weeks ago about the impact of equalities legislation that sometimes seems like it provides additional help for everyone except men and boys. One of my great passions and the campaign I most regularly return to in this place, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that of working class boys in areas like Mansfield and in other parts of the country where there's deep and entrenched disadvantage. Figures from education show that these lads are least likely of any group to do well at school, to improve their lot in life, to get to university, to ever have the opportunity to spread their wings further afield and aspire beyond the borders of the place they grew up in. Working class white boys often seem to sit bottom of the pile. Across the board in our education system, the advancements of girls has been noticeable. It should be celebrated and recognised that girls are doing much better in recent years. That's brilliant news. It's the result of countless interventions and programmes of support, but it also needs to be recognised that boys very often are not. More often than not, they don't have the same encouragement. No matter what race, geography or social class involved, girls are now outperforming boys throughout the education system. For example, in GCSE attainment, three quarters passed in 2019 compared to two thirds of boys. We've had reports of record high gender gaps in university places, where girls are third more likely to access higher education than boys. And it brings me back, Madam Deputy Speaker, to my debate on the Equalities Act, so often misinterpreted and misunderstood. If we know that boys are now hugely underrepresented at university, a growing problem, where are all the programmes to support boys into HE? Personally, I'm not keen on discriminating by gender or by any other physical characteristic, uh, given that it's the law that we, uh, the Act pushes for positive action based on these characteristics in order to level the playing field. Where is the support for those who are struggling? The figures clearly show that girls are already outperforming boys, so why are we allowing the kind of misuse of our equalities law to exacerbate gender inequality rather than fix it, with countless programmes to support girls into HE and none for boys. Would my friend give way? I will give way. Thank my honourable friend for giving way. Would he join with me in looking to the very exciting prospect of the holiday uh, and activities food programme to come, and that we must do all within our power to encourage maximum participation from these walking, uh, working class uh, boys, particularly? I thank you for that intervention. She's absolutely right that constituencies and communities like uh, the one that I represent with these lads really struggling uh, and uh, I've talked myself about the need for face-to-face -face contact and support for the most disadvantaged children. It will be hugely important. I thank her for raising that. Um, on the, the, the Equalities Act, I mean, what is the point of this Act if it's based, uh, used based only on what seems popular or politically correct rather than based on reality in order to help those most in need? The reality tells us, the figures tell us that it's boys that need the help in terms of higher education more so than girls. So are these interventions actually making this inequality worse? Possibly so. But that's not to say don't help girls, Mr. Spe uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. To be absolutely clear, it's not to say that. But simply to say selecting who to help based on physical characteristics alone is, in my view, the very definition of discrimination. The need for this help should be evidenced if it's to comply with the law. And it's to say that boys need help too. They seem consistently left behind by this kind of politically correct agenda. And in my view, as long as the Equality Act continues to be so willfully and regularly misapplied across gender, race and every other characteristic, it can do more harm than good. We need to make clear in this place that we should be helping people based on their actual needs, that the Act applies equally to everybody. Wouldn't it be nice to try and help those most in need based not on their physical characteristics, but actually on what they need? Or at least to recognise we all have equal protection under this law, whether you're a gay, BME, female or a straight white man, those are all protected characteristics. 
There are countless challenges facing men in our society. Three times as many men as women die by suicide, with men aged 40 to 49 actually having the highest rates. Men report lower levels of life satisfaction, according to the government's National Wellbeing Survey, but are less likely to access psychological therapies. Nearly three quarters of adults who go missing are men. 87% of rush sleepers are men. Men are three times as likely to become dependent on alcohol or drugs, more likely to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act, more likely to be a victim of violent crime. And of course, men make up the vast majority of the prison population. These figures really put that male privilege in perspective, Madam Deputy Speaker. In recent years, it seemed like there are more and more of those kind of phrases coming in to use designed to undermine the role and confidence of men in our society. I mentioned a few before, things like male privilege, like toxic masculinity. How about mansplaining, manterrupting, the trend of spelling woman with an X to re remove the undesirable man part. Wonderfully empowering for some, I'm sure, but as I said back at the beginning of the speech, seeking equality and fairness doesn't need to mean dragging everyone around you down. I'm fairly sure that bad behaviour is not limited solely to the male of the species, nor is rudeness gender specific. The outcome of this discourse and this language for many men is a serious one. I think particularly in the most disadvantaged communities, there's such a thing as a set of working class values, values that have lasted many decades that might be considered old hat or even sexist by the modern establishment. It's a set of values where you hold the door open for a lady, where a man might be expected to stick around and provide for his family, where the role of men as a worker and a breadwinner as a positive role model for his children is still entrenched and well taught. It's not to the detriment of women or to limit their ambition, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's about the promotion of family, of tradition, of strong male role models. These things are important. Having been brought up with those values, you can see why a lot of men from those communities would feel lost if they were unable to find work due to our economic situation, might feel helpless or like failures. They're far from it, but they need our support. You might also find, particularly when considering young men who are looking ahead at their life and seeking their purpose, that they might struggle to find it when they're told that those things they thought were virtues, their good manners, they're wanting to provide for their family, wanting to be a man's man, wanting to go down to the football at the weekend and have some banter with the lads. These things are in fact not virtuous. They are, of course, toxic. They're da uh, doing down the women around them. Those manners they were taught, the way to respect the women in their life are now sexist. That banter is now bullying. On family, rather than promoting strong male role models, we often encourage dads to be more like mums. Try to break down that tradition, teach them the opposite of what they've always been told growing up and that they've been doing it wrong. We talk of deadbeat dads. We have a legal system in family courts that seems to uh, assume the guilt of many men in a relationship. We have men being alienated from their kids. We talk more and more about how desirable it is to have different kinds of families. The implication being that we don't need these strong male role models. Is it any wonder so many are struggling to figure out all of this out? It's right that people should live by their own choices and be who they want to be, how they are comfortable. And that is equally true whether you're gay or straight, black or white, male or female. It's equally true if you're, what you want to be is to fulfil that traditional role of a strong father, a provider, a breadwinner. To be fair, for, to be, for, for want of a better word, a bloke. I fear that we're building up huge problems for the future when we forget the traditional role of men and in fact sometimes not just forget it but try to eradicate it from our society. With very few of life's advantages on our side in this environment, it's no wonder, Mr. S uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, when society seems insistent on ripping the heart out of things that they've experienced growing up and things that they've been taught, so many young men tragically cut their lives short. We can't continue to talk down the role and the purpose of young men when we should be building them up. I want to move on from the gloom and doom a little bit and, by, and talk about some positive things and some actions that we can take, and I particularly want to pay tribute to dads. I want to say today in this chamber, to all those dads who are putting their families first and doing the right thing, I want to say thank you. I think it's something that's taken for granted, but it's so important. And I know myself how difficult it is uh, in this job to balance being a dad with work and trying to keep yourself on a level and live up to expectations, and it's not easy. I know there are countless thousands of dads out there with a much tougher task than me, dads who might be struggling financially, dads who might be battling things like trying to see their kids, fighting in family courts to do the right thing, trying to be a role model to their kids, when truthfully, we're all making it up as we go along. Dads who might be trying to overcome their own challenges, mental health or work or stress, and might feel like they have to hide that away for the sake of their families and their children. I want to say a big thank you to good dads and to those who are trying their best to be good dads and good men, because I think that can make all the difference for our kids, for families and for our society. And I want to say that there are places and people you can go to if you need that help. Places like the Samaritans, Rethink, the Calm Helpline, Safe Line, a friend or a relative. It's good to talk, as they say, rather than sweep things under the carpet. So what more can we do in this place? 
We can change the discourse here, Madam Deputy Speaker, for starters. Can we look again at equalities legislation? If we are to hold departments across Whitehall to account with people dedicated to ensuring that women are considered, quite rightly so, why not the same for men? Why have a minister for women but not one for men? Why single out one characteristic for special mention? Can we ensure that equality means just that, rather than positive discrimination at the expense of certain groups? Male is equally protected as female, and could we, do, uh, we could do worse in this place to confirm how the Act should be properly used. Can we promote the role of fatherhood and stop shying away from the importance of that role? Yes, families come in all shapes and sizes. I don't wish to detract from anyone who wants to do things differently, but there's a positive role to be played by an active father that cannot and should not be ignored. Modern families are all different, but you can guarantee every single one of them involves or has involved in one way or another a dad. And the vast majority of families still look like mum, dad and kids. And that is not and should not be something we shy away from. Can we push forward an action plan to look at male suicide? Well, we know these figures are awful and have someone in government accountable for delivery of that plan, including better access to mental health support. Can we review our legal system, which is not always balanced, and our family courts, which seem too often to consider dads to be guilty until proven innocent, when it seems like parental alienation is increasing and more and more dads feel they've been let down by the system? Can we reform the child maintenance service, the bane of every MP's life, by the way, so that it's fairer to all parties and works in the interests of families? Can we have a long-term plan to improve the alcohol and addiction services that are available, the need for which is overwhelmingly male-dominated? Can we boost support for new fathers as well as mothers at a time when men can feel, uh, often feel totally helpless? I'm really pleased that the Prime Minister's race disparity audit, though as the name suggests it focused on race in particular, includes looking at the educational attainment and support for white working class boys. There are regional inequalities there, cultural ones, gender based ones, but the challenge faced by boys in education can't be denied. The figures show a clear picture of increasing numbers of left behind boys going into troubled young men seeking purpose. This is a huge challenge for our wider society, and I hope we can build on this work to look at it in more detail. With that, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll end. I want to give as much time as I can for colleagues. Uh, with a thank you to the Minister for her consideration today, and I look forward to listening to the thoughts of colleagues in the chamber. The question is as on the order paper, and we'll have to rush into this with a time limit of three minutes for backbench speeches, and there won't be much time for frontbench speeches either. Philip Davis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As I've said before, there are many areas where I think men are disproportionately affected and which do not get enough focus in this House, and this debate should be about highlighting those things. I commend my honourable friend, the member for Mansfield, for his speech. Uh, unsurprisingly, I completely agree with him, particularly with regard to the points he made about the disadvantage and poor outcomes, especially in education, of white working class boys, something the politically correct lobby has brushed under the carpet for too long. Just this week, Bradford Council have been consulted on their latest equality plan. They have set targets for people in jobs, including one for 65% of their top 5% of employees to be female. Now, I don't believe in quotas and targets. I believe each job should be awarded on merit and merit alone. But even if you go along with all of this so-called equality, where on earth is the equality in that target? The leader of Bradford Council represents a ward in my constituency with a high proportion of white working class people in it. And yet she is completely silent in her so-called equality plan about this, despite the fact she must know the disadvantage they face. My honourable friend, the member for Mansfield, has also brilliantly defended good dads, and I want to absolutely echo that message today. I know of men who have had their lives ruined because of a relationship breakdown, which has needlessly led to a whole family breakdown, and in some cases a mental breakdown too. I've talked about parental alienation before, and do not apologise for mentioning it again. It is quite simply abuse, and the many people who have written to me with their heartbreaking personal stories show how this happens all too often. It is abuse against the alienated parent, which is not just men, and also against the sons and daughters of the parent too. It also affects a whole host of people in the wider family. I'm pleased that the Government have taken some of my points on board with the Domestic Abuse Bill going through Parliament and included parental alienation as an example of abuse in the draft statutory guidance. But I hope the Government will continue to look at ways to prevent this, as it would make a huge positive difference to so many if it could be stamped out. Which finally leads me on to suicide. Men's suicide has been a common theme of all the past debates on International Men's Day, and rightly so. As has been said, suicide rates amongst men are three times higher than for women in the UK. The connection between relationship breakdown and suicide risk in Western countries has been studied, and I believe that the data from these studies 
indicates that unsurprisingly re relationship breakdown elevates suicide risk in both sexes and more so for men. None of the studies apparently investigated the specific effect on the likelihood of suicide following father's separation from their children, despite charities reporting that this is the overwhelming source of that distress. It is quite clear to me that we need to do a lot more to ensure fathers are not stopped from seeing their children to save lives. And in these COVID lockdown times, it's too easy to imagine how this will be causing even more mental health problems and very unfortunately, more suicides. Elliot Colman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And in my short contribution, as someone who used to work in the National Health Service, I would like to focus on the health challenges faced by men. And I think I'd like to focus on three primary areas in the short time I have available to me. Uh, the first is in relation to the current pandemic and coronavirus, uh, with PHE's review demonstrating that despite making up only 46% of diagnosed cases, 60% um, of deaths are men and 70% of admissions to intensive care are men. And working age males that are diag diagnosed with COVID-19 are, tw are twice as likely to die. Now, I know that the Minister is continuing cross-departmental work uh, of, to understand the risk factors associated with this disease. So I would hope that we continue to look into the reasons behind why this disparity exists. Uh, the second health risk I'd like to focus on is cancer. Uh, in men in the UK, prostate cancer is the most common cancer, uh, and prostate cancer is the second most common cause of death, with around 12,000 deaths of prostate cancer in 2017. Uh, in addition, the, since the early 1990s, cysticular cancer incidents have raised by nearly 24% among men in the UK. Now, I know that there has been great strides here. We are, we've seen huge strides in survival rates, particularly among prostate cancer, from 76% of people dying within 10 years in the 70s to just 16% now. But there is still a lot more to do. And I know the NHS long-term plan has an, has an ambitious cancer screening commitment, but this must also be coupled with work done to tackle the stigma around men's health, uh, particularly around male can cancers, and too many men leaving it too late before they seek help. But I think, as uh, honourable members have already outlined, one of the most chilling statistics comes in the form of mental health and suicide. Uh, because it truly is a terrible thing that the single biggest cause of death in men under 45 in the United Kingdom is men taking their own life. Men account for about three quarters of suicide deaths registered in England and Wales. Uh, and middle-aged men in the UK have uh, the highest average suicide rate of any age group. Now, I again want to draw attention to the good work of the NHS long-term plan, work, uh, which is working to design a new mental health strategy uh, improvement programme which will focus on suicide protection. Uh, ministers say that reducing suicides remains an NHS priority, uh, and I would urge them to ensure that that is the case, because it cannot be right for the most common cause of death for anyone of any age, gender, sexuality, race, religion or creed comes from them taking their own life. So I would urge the government to do all it can to make sure that these terrible health statistics are consigned to the dustbin of history as soon as possible. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow my honourable friend from Carl Shotland Wallington um, in a very informative speech. And he's touched on many of the points that um, I also wish to raise. But um, in beginning my comments, can I also commend my honourable friend from Mansfield for highlighting these issues? He's been an ardent campaigner on this since he was elected to this house and beforehand and you know these are issues that we we just have to talk about and i want to um i want to focus my comments today on three areas in particular which is firstly domestic abuse secondly mental health and thirdly the attainment gap that my um, honorable friend from mansfield articulated um so well in terms of the, the points there can i first of all pay tribute actually to uh, my honourable friend from, from Louth and Horncastle, the Minister of Justice, for piloting through the Domestic Abuse Bill, which is uh, currently awaiting its second reading in the other place. This bill will ensure that all victims have the confidence to report their experiences of domestic abuse. But when we look at domestic abuse around male victims, we see that 786,000 men have reported being victims of domestic abuse. And when we look at actually the numbers of men that are prepared to report domestic abuse, in comparison to 88% for women, only, only just over half of men will report domestic abuse at any one time. And in terms of refuges and safe houses, currently there are 37 organisations with 204 spaces. Of those 204 spaces available, only 40 of them are dedicated for men. And in Greater London, there are no spaces for men needing refuge from domestic abuse. The, the respect... Um, Men's advice line has said that some victims of domestic, male victims of domestic abuse have reported sleeping in cars or in tents or in the gardens of their relatives to avoid, um, to seek refuge from, from their abusers. The fact is, Madam Deputy Speaker, as someone that 
as seen domestic abuse firsthand, the ability to escape that is absolutely fundamental to ensure people survive. And we need to be doing more to ensure that there is provision there, because there clearly is a gap in provision, even though I pay tribute absolutely to those organisations who are supporting um, those victims and those survivors, shall we say, of domestic abuse. In terms of mental health issues, my honourable friend from Carshalton and Wallington um, articulated it absolutely perfectly in that 75% of men, um, so suicide deaths in England and Wales are men. We need to tackle that, but we need to tackle that across the board as well. It's not, it's not right. We need to be looking at those fundamental underlying issues that um, lead, to, lead to these deaths. And I don't want to repeat the stats that, that my honourable friend um, read out, but I, I do just want to round off my comments by, by saying this. You know, ultimately, this is about ensuring that all of us have the access to those, those services, that support that we need. We should value everyone as that individual, as that core person as to who they are irrespective of gender, irrespective of what they look like, irrespective of where they come from. And I think that what this debate highlights today, Madam Deputy Speaker, and what my honourable friend from Mansfield has done, has drawn that out once again. And I pay tribute to him, and I pay tribute to the fantastic work that's being done to support men in the areas that I've highlighted today. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Mm -hmm. Tom Hunt. Mr Speaker, I'd first like to thank uh, my honourable friend for Mansfield for securing this uh, vital debate. And I, I do agree with his comments about the um, underperformance of... Um, uh, boys from uh, uh, white boys from underprivileged backgrounds in the school system, the facts are there for themselves, um, they can't be disputed and I think it's right that the education committee that I sit on is currently looking at this issue in depth. And that isn't to say we're not going to look at other issues, but why shouldn't we look at this one issue as well as other issues as well? And I, I want to talk about men's mental health, which I think um, is getting more attention now than it ever has done. But the simple fact is that many men who struggle with their mental health don't feel comfortable talking about it. Whether they think deep down it's a sign of weakness, of course they're wrong, it's not. Uh, they should feel comfortable to talk about it. And I think to myself, but I think that awareness of mental health now is greater than it's ever been. And I think, and the reason for that is because there isn't a single person in this country whose mental health hasn't been impacted to some extent. And I think even about my father, if I'd spoken to him uh, a year or two ago about mental health, he probably would have said sort of, you know, man up, you know, stiff up in a kind of very ma masculine approach to it. Whereas, you know, 75 years old, somebody had to shield himself. I remember talking to him about this very issue not long ago. And, for, and I never thought I'd hear it. My dad himself was talking about his mental health. And actually, I think that's a good thing. And I think we should encourage more of that. So there are great challenges. And the pandemic has, um, you know, brought this to, to light more than ever. Many of the things that um, men rely upon, you know, going to watch a football, fishing, golf, these sorts of things haven't been possible, particularly during the second lockdown. I'd like to highlight something brilliant, though, which is happening within Ipswich, which is in Chantry. And the local landlady, Penny, spoke to me over the summer about the problem of men's mental health and how she wanted to do something about it. Uh, within a very small period of time, uh, two to three months, she now has 33 members of her men's mental health support group in Chantry, Rex Manning from the local area, professional trained chef. And what they've done is they've actually secured an allotment, a Robin Drive allotment. They all go down there. All of the men go down and become members, talk. Uh, so actually, even if I don't feel comfortable talking about their mental health directly, by engaging in something which is so good for our well-being like that, it, it really brings people together and the whole community together. And also the produce they make for vegetables, Rex uh, then collects it all together and they all eat it together in the local pub. So this is a very challenging issue. It's right that we have this debate. But on the topic of men's mental health, I do think there's a great opportunity here. I think the pandemic's highlighted mental health more than ever before. But talking about your mental health is not a sign of weakness. It's something that should be encouraged. And I think it's, it's right that we have this debate here today. And, and, I, and I commend my honourable friend for the Manfield for securing it. Thank you very much. An honourable gentleman has um, unusually withdrawn from the debate, which gives us a tiny bit of extra time. I'm therefore going to raise the back bench limit to four minutes. Alexander Stafford. Speech, the good news. Uh, I commend my honourable friend, the member of Mansfield, for securing this very important debate. We both understand the acute disadvantages and difficulties experienced by men in our region of the UK, ranging from health and education to incarceration and suicide. I welcome the opportunity to draw the House attention to this unacceptable inequality and set up for men and boys in my constituency. We do not talk about men's mental health enough, and toxic masculinity is a severe problem. Tragically, suicide remains the biggest killer for men under the age of 45. Research also suggests that men who are less well-off and living in most deprived areas are up to 10 times more likely to die by suicide than more well-off men 
from affluent areas. A grim statistic that's relevant to areas of high deprivation, such as mine in Bother Valley, the likes of Maltby and in Dinnington. This must be addressed. But beyond the realms of health, many men suffer from low attainment and reduced opportunities at every stage of life. This is of particular concern to me in Rother Valley. At school, it is an old adage that girls consistently outperform boys at GCSE level, and they have done so for the past 30 years. At higher education level, six, over 67,000 fewer men than women accept place at university, a huge gap of 35%. After 10 years of government reforms, standards are indeed increasing. However, for areas like mine in Rother Valley, this cannot come soon enough. And we must continue to put pressure on schools, universities and companies to do more for working class boys and men. And I read only this week that SOAS in 2017 did not accept any working class boy, white working class boys into their university. And that is a disgrace. Now it's also worth that women in Rother Valley are in full support of empowering our local men. They see the everyday struggles of their fathers, brothers, sons, uncles, grandfathers and friends. They do not have the reductive mindset pushed by many liberal metropolitan elite of the Labour Party, where men as a whole species are blamed for gender inequality. Instead, they recognise that women still face substantial social inequality, and they absolutely do so. But so do many of our men. For example, 79,000 people are in prison, 96% of whom are male, a shocking statistic. These men cannot be blamed for having privilege they simply do not possess. I'm in full agreement with my honourable friend, the member for Mansfield, on this point. I want to lift everyone up, men and women, rather than dragging them down. This, of course, fits with the persistent campaign for Rother Valley to be levelled up across the board, in all areas, in all sectors, but especially for all people. Growing up in Maltby or Dinnington should not mean that you have a lesser chance of succeeding professionally, and it should not mean that you're, you lack access to high quality services and facilities. Unfortunately, too many men and boys in Rother Valley tell me exactly this. They feel abandoned, left behind and forgotten. It is in everybody's interest that we raise our men's aspirations and help them use their inherent talents to reach their full potential. I firmly believe that this government is doing so for men, boys and everyone, but especially for those in Rother Valley. Madam Deputy Speaker, International Men's Day has been an annual event since 2010. The UK has the most events of its kind anywhere in the world, and it's overseen by the Men and Boys Coalition. It's a registered charity of over 100 organisations, academics and professionals um, who believe in a society which values the well-being of men and boys. Some very positive themes. It makes a positive difference to well-being. It raises awareness and funds for charities supporting men and boys and it promotes a positive conversation about men, manhood and masculinity, all of which is a very good thing. But there are some serious themes too. In 1998, my very closest friend um, sadly committed suicide. It was a devastating event for me and his family and all of his friends. Um, and I'm very well versed by the mess that's left behind. So we must end the stigma of men's mental health. And we need to commend the truth that it's okay not to feel okay. So please seek help is the simple answer. But it's also about the challenges faced by men and boys at all stages of education. It's about shorter life expectancies, about infertility, workplace death. It's about challenges faced by the most marginalized men in society, homeless, boys in care. It's about inner cities, black and white working class males. Male victims of violence. It's about the challenges faced by men as parents and about survivors of sexual abuse, rape and domestic abuse. It's all relevant. And in this era of identity politics, it's becoming increasingly popular to ridicule men who display traits of traditional masculinity, of self-reliance, of personal responsibility, of discipline and of courage, even fatherhood. Well, guess what? I don't subscribe to that because all men matter. Indeed, the UK prides itself on being amongst the top meritocracies in the world. Equality of opportunity is something that we absolutely must strive for. So it's about black and white, gay and straight, male and female. Everyone has a role, and no one must feel ashamed of who they are. So this is not about men as a comparative species. 
It's simply about drawing attention to particular issues affecting men. Lastly, some quick stats, if I may. In 2018, almost 5,000 men took their own lives at a rate of 13 per day. That's a rate of 17.2 per 100,000. This is the highest rate since 2013, and men also make up 75% of suicides. Girls are now 14% more likely than boys to pass exams in English and maths. Boys have more than three times the number of permanent exclusions, with 6,000 permanent exclusions. Much of this is down, I think, to ADHD and ASD, a separate issue in itself, but one that we really need to look at very closely. And 96% of 79,000 people in prison are also male. So, we've got work to do. Thank you very much indeed. Russell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Globally, it is estimated by the World Health Organization that 800,000 people die every year due to suicide. And globally, one in ten um, are, uh, or one tenth are, are men, three quarters are, are male in the UK. And I do question why is it that men suffer the most with suicide? And I think often it's down to the challenges in society and the fact that we as a male species do not ask for help. During my maiden speech, I spoke about the concept of HOPE being an acronym, that it stands for H-O-P-E, help one person every day. And I think sometimes that one person has to be ourselves. But it's so hard to ask for help when it's seen as a weakness. And I would like to say to anyone who's out there right now who's suffering, to know that it's not a weakness, it's a strength to ask for help and ask for that support. When I look at the social media narrative, when I look at the, the divisive, often, uh, debate around masculinity and around men, I find that I draw back to my belief that we cannot heal divisions by being divisive. We cannot tackle hatred by being hateful. And we cannot show our strength only by belittling those who show weakness. And I think when we look at the debate that we have in this chamber today, it should not be limited to the time we have here. It should be a societal debate around how do we actually tackle these big challenges in society? How do we look at tackling the stigma, not just through medical support and support through NHS, but through the narrative that we provide both as politicians and as members of the public? We need to listen to each other. And sometimes when I look at the world, especially through the lens of social media and the web and the media, I feel like we're in a world full of those shouting. And it makes me ask, who are those who are listening? And so I ask today, let us all listen to what people are saying. Let's not consider men to be the enemy. We are all part of the important fabric of society. We have all got differences. And to anyone who's struggling right now, who's thinking the worst thoughts in their minds, remember that you're unique. You're on this planet of one of seven billion, and you are the only version of you. And that you need to continue your story. You need to be here for one more day. Just give it another few minutes, another hour, another day. Just give yourself a bit more time to find out why you're really here. Because the power of that story, the power of overcoming that, will make a difference to others, and it will make a difference to those around you, and by God, it will make a difference to your family and friends. Because if they do not have you here tomorrow, if they do not have the stories and the joys of the difficult times, as well as the joyful times, then we all lack because of that. So I ask all of us, please, ask for help if you need it, and ask others if they need help. Remember, it's okay to not be okay, as my, right hon uh, my uh, honourable friends have said. But it's also okay to ask others if they're okay. It's okay to say to them, you know, are you really okay? Ask them more than once, because that second time, that third time, might be the chance for them to open up in a way that they never have before. So I am so pleased to my mem uh, honourable friend from, from Mansfield for uh, organising this debate today, because without it, we may not have these voices. And today, we might change someone's life. And if off the back of today, we stop just one person from committing suicide, even if it's over the next 100 years, that will have made this debate worthwhile. Thank you.
David Linden. Shit, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I say what a pleasure it is to follow the Honourable Gentleman from Watford, who um, I have always thought since he arrived in this House last December that he was an incredibly thoughtful person. I think that speech there just personifies that. So thank you very much. Um, I'm grateful as well to the Honourable Member for Mansfield for securing today's debate. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome to the Dispatch Box my honourable friend from Warrington North. I understand it's her debut at the Dispatch Box. Um, she's a fellow member of the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme. Uh, and so when I finally shut up and sat down, I'll certainly be cheering her on. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, clearly the COVID-19 pandemic has hugely impacted everyone's lives. Many of our constituents now face insecurity around their employment and financial hardship, alongside having, a, having to deal with restrictions around seeing loved ones. And never before in our lifetimes have we experienced a global pandemic, which effectively shut down society, closed businesses, and asked us all to, to stay at home. So I, I particularly worry about everyone's mental health at the moment. And I know that continued lockdowns and restrictions can be incredibly tough, especially as we now head towards the winter months, full of colder days and, and darker evenings. But today's debate is a, a good opportunity to focus on, on men's mental health. We know, as, as others have said, that men are typically less likely to reach out for help surrounding their mental health. Just uh, over three out of four suicides are by men, uh, and suicide is the biggest cause of death for, for men under 35. Men are nearly three times more likely than women to become alcohol dependent, and men are, are less likely to access psychological therapies than women. Indeed, only 36% of referrals to psychological therapies are for men. I know from personal experience that, that conversations around mental health can, can feel tough, they can be sensitive, private and awkward, but they are so, so important, particularly at the moment. And with further restrictions and lockdowns, we are all more isolated than ever. A survey done in April showed that one in four UK adults had feelings of loneliness, compared to just one in ten before the pandemic. Young people aged between 18 to 24 were mo most likely to experience loneliness uh, since lockdown began. Indeed, before lockdown, one in six said that they felt lonely. Since lockdown, young people are almost three times more likely uh, to experience loneliness, with almost half feeling this way. Uh, in a time when we're, we're more of us are feeling isolated and lonely, it's important, therefore, to reach out to our loved ones. Uh, a simple text, phone call or FaceTime can make the world a difference. But in terms of men's mental health, there still exists that, that stigma around acknowledging that you are struggling uh, and seeking the help that you need. Um, for example, in 2016, a survey conducted by the Opinion Leader for Men's uh, Health Forum found that 34% of men were ashamed to, to take time off work for mental health concerns, compared to 13% for a, a physical injury. 38% of men would be concerned that their employer would think badly of them if they took time off work for a mental health concern, compared to 26% for a physical injury. And I think the Honourable Gentleman Member for Manfield uh, kind of touched on this, but you know, phrases like man up and toughened up, you know, they only reinforce the stereotypes that men should be stoic and face these problems alone. Um, and I think this is dangerous rhetoric and prevents men from pursuing health. And I'm really glad that all Honourable Members who have spoken today have certainly put that on the record. So it's important that men come together and support one another. And that's why I'm, I'm such a passionate supporter of Shelton Men's Shed, as well as the Men's Self Group in my constituency led by Jim Malcolmson. But we should uh, be encouraging men to acknowledge that the, the, the stressors of this unprecedented public health crisis will naturally have an impact on our mental health, whether that be due to, to, to loss of employment, financial insecurity, or just missing our loved ones. I think we would all agree that this is a very tough time for everyone. So my message to everyone, not just to men, uh, but men in particular, is please reach out to your loved ones. Let them know that you're always there to listen, to take care of one another, because this too will pass. Yeah. Charlotte Nichols. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is a pleasure to respond to this debate on behalf of Her Majesty's Opposition. As a Shadow Minister for Women and Equalities, I am conscious that we should not seek to pit the problems of men and women against each other, but to aspire to raise outcomes where one is below the other. We have heard a number of important contributions in this debate. Firstly, I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman for Shipley and Mansfield for securing it through the Backbench Business Committee. And we see that it is now truly an annual occasion after a year's absence as it fell during the election campaign last year. 
Having read through previous Hansards of previous iterations of this debate, I am both reassured that we are continuing to emphasise these important issues, but also concerned to note that they still need to be raised. The ongoing tragedy of male suicides has continued, with a rate in England and Wales of 16.9 deaths per 100,000, the highest since 2000, and remaining in line with the rate in 2018, making up around three quarters of suicides. Males aged 45 to 49 years still have the highest age-specific suicide rate. A number of colleagues have mentioned charities that work hard in this field, and so I commend the work of Calm, Rethink, Mind and the other organisations highlighted, and I'd also like to remind all members present that the Samaritans can be phoned at any time, day or night, on 116 123. The same messages are given every year and are ever more relevant in 2020 with its stress and fear. Men should feel able to talk about their problems with friends or with professionals. They don't have to do it in public like honourable members have today, but society must accept and embrace a more open understanding of men's feelings and concerns. I include in this men who may be gay, bisexual or transgender who feel alone or scared about their very identities who must be more supportive of each other. And I note the news today that the government is ending the £4 million funding for anti-LGBT bullying in our schools. This is a real step backwards that will prolong harm for too many young boys. I cannot join Movember, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I praise the members who are doing it this year and hope that they may continue to brighten the spotlight on men's health. Most obviously, COVID has had a disproportionately fatal impact on men. As further research unearths more about what is still a very new virus, we may find out why. On prostate cancer, the second biggest killer of men worldwide, I encourage men to discuss this with their doctors at 50, and black men or men with a family history of prostate cancer should discuss it at 45. On testicular cancer, men should know how to test themselves. It's not taboo to look these things up. Men are more likely to die prematurely than women, including of diseases that are considered preventable. Please don't be too scared to ask questions for fear of some toxic male expectations or image. And thank you to the Honourable Member for Carshalton and Wallington for raising these health issues. We have rightly heard today about the challenges of boys' educational entertainment and the need for schools and the Department for Education to address this. Whether this means more male teachers, more male role models, closer support or attention to alternate teaching methods, it is a real concern. The literacy gap between boys and girls peaks at 16 when children are beginning to consider their choices for life after school. Men are still more likely to be victims of violent crime in the UK and men are nearly twice as likely as women to be a victim of violent crime and among children boys are more likely than girls to be victims of violence, while more than two-thirds of murder victims are male. It is also worth mentioning that the male victims of domestic violence and the statistics that show that they are less likely to speak out or confide in somebody about it, they must not be forgotten, something which was raised in a powerful contribution to the debate by the Honourable Member for West Bromwich West. As the days and nights get colder and wetter, it is sombre to think of the thousands of rough sleepers on our streets. The government's actions earlier in the year showed that it is possible to eliminate rough sleeping, but now, once again, there are huge numbers of people forced to choose between a cold winter on the streets of our country or the threat of catching COVID in an overcrowded shelter. And government statistics state that 86% of rough sleepers in England are male. I hope the Minister can say what will be done to end this awful situation. Finally, it is worth remembering that today is International Men's Day and we should consider the problems that men and boys face around the world, where they die on average six years before women, where thousands are forced into becoming child soldiers and gay men in particular are all too often oppressed with threats of violent death. Once again, I thank all of the speakers and hope that next year's debate we will be able to report on progress in these many important areas. Yeah, 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 yeah. Minister Cammy Badenoch. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, just before the Minister starts, I must commend the House. I said we'd have to rush through this. 
I was expecting the Minister to be on her feet with only five minutes to spare. But the House has been so disciplined, speeches have been so to the point, precise, moving and clever, I hope that other people will learn that brevity is indeed the soul of wit. I'm not going to mention the fact that very few women have taken part in the debate this afternoon. Kami Bainov. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to be standing at the dispatch box on International Men's Day, and I thank the Backbench Business Committee for granting a debate on this important subject, and I thank all the honourable and right honourable members who have made heartfelt contributions today. I also welcome the member for Warrington South to her position as Shadow Minister. International Men's Day is an opportunity to celebrate men and boys in all their diversity and to shine a spotlight on the issues which affect men from shared parenting to health and well-being. Um, I think it's sad that uh, on a day like this, it seems to be mainly members on this side of the House uh, who uh, felt interested enough to speak. I recognise the shadow spokespeople were here, but it does highlight the fact that this is an issue that many people believe is not important enough to speak on, and I hope maybe next time she will speak to her colleagues and, um, and across the House uh, for this reason. David Lind. The restrictions on the virtual participation, that might be why there are fewer members taking part in this debate. Minister. Um, I understand that, but this is not the only debate that has taken place today, and they have been very, very well attended indeed. So it, um, I'm afraid I don't accept that position. And like I said, I hope at the next International Men's Day debate we will see many more members participating in this debate. Um, this government is committed to levelling up opportunity and ensuring fairness for all. As Minister for Equalities, I want to ensure no one is left behind, regardless of their sex or background. Both men and women in the UK benefit from us having some of the strongest equality legislation in the world. The Equality Hub will consider sex along with factors like race, sexual orientation, geography and socio-economic background so we can ensure we are levelling up across the country. This will support data-driven policy to reduce disparity across the Union and make the UK the best place to live, work and grow a business. Levelling up is the mission of this Government and every one of us should be free and able to fulfil our potential. The member for, uh, for Carshalton and Wallington mentioned the coronavirus, which, as we all know, is the biggest challenge the UK has faced in decades, and we are not alone. All over the world, we are seeing the devastating impact of this disease. We know that men have been disproportionately impacted by COVID and that after-age sex is the second largest single risk factor. However, not all men are the same, and not all men will be affected in the same way. My report into COVID disparity showed, for example, that the job you do, where you live, who you live with and your underlying health all make a huge difference to your risk of COVID-19. We recognise how important it is that each individual understands how different factors and characteristics combine to influence their personal risk. The Chief Medical Officer commissioned an expert group to develop a risk model to do just this and DHSC are working at pace on how to apply the model. As well as the impact on lives, COVID has had a huge impact on Britain's livelihoods, those livelihoods which give us pride and a way to support our families. Because, of course, men and women do not exist separately and in isolation. We are part of families, businesses and part of our communities, which is why our support is targeted at those most in need and looks at how issues are impacting individuals, not homogenous groups, so that we ensure a fair recovery for everyone. As a Treasury Minister, I'm particularly proud of our comprehensive package to protect jobs, which the IMF highlighted as one of the best examples of coordinated action globally. We've given unprecedented support, as this House has heard time and time again, through the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme and the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme, to ensure people can get the support they need, especially those in sectors, in sectors most affected by COVID-19. The members for Watford, Ipswich and West Bromwich East spoke passionately about mental health. The challenges this year have no doubt taken their toll on many people's mental well-being. It is very understandable during these uncertain and unusual times to be experiencing distress or anxiety or to be feeling low, and we know this affects many men. These are common reactions to the difficult situation we all face. Anyone experiencing distress, anxiety or feeling low can visit the Every Mind Matters website and gov.uk for advice and tailored practical steps to support well-being and manage mental health during this pandemic. Yes, of course. 
I wonder if the uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, if the Government also consider research by the Samaritans, which talks very much about middle-aged uh, men who are often missed in terms of community-based support um, when facing mental health crisis that can often lead, lead to suicide, and perhaps that could be something that the Government factors in, so that those people that are not necessarily so visually seen as the people most at risk can also be supported at times of crisis. I completely agree. I completely agree with you, uh, Honourable Gentleman. We know that some men are less likely than women to seek help with their mental health, and some can be reluctant to engage with health and other support services. So, and it's right that he highlights this. This is why I say to every man that the NHS is open for business. We really want to stress this. I would urge any man, whatever his age or background, who is struggling to speak to a GP and seek out mental health support delivered by charities or the NHS. Services are still operating, and it's better to get help early. The NHS this week launched its Help Us Help You campaign, which uh, is relevant to the point the Honourable Gentleman just raised. It's a major campaign to encourage people who may be struggling with common mental health illnesses to come forward for help through NHS talking therapies, also known as improving access to psychological therapies, which are a confidential service run by fully trained experts. I'm sure the Minister for Suicide Prevention and Mental Health will consider his point and will also consider my honourable friend, the member for Mansfield's request for an action plan for men's uh, mental health and suicide. I would also like to remind people that the Help Us Help You campaigns have sought to increase um, people, from com people coming forward with worrying cancer symptoms, including for testicular cancer and prostate cancer. I know the member for Bracknell spoke movingly about his friend uh, who tragically lost his life and urged men to seek the help that they need, as did the uh, member for Glasgow East. The current campaign will run throughout the winter to ensure that men feel able to come forward and get tested and treated early. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to close by taking a moment to celebrate the contribution. Oh, pardon me. I believe the, um, the Honourable Lady asked about uh, rough sleeping. Um, I just wanted to answer her question on what the government is doing. On the 18th of July, we launched the Next Steps Accommodation Programme, which makes funding available to support local authorities and their partners to prevent previous rough sleepers from returning to the streets. The programme comprises £161 million to deliver 3,300 units of longer-term move-on accommodation in 2020-21, and £105 million to pay for immediate support to ensure people do not return to the streets. On the 17th of September, we announced local authority allocations for the short-term funding aspect of this programme. £91.5 million was allocated to 274 councils in England to help vulnerable people housed during the pandemic. And recently, on the 29th of October, we announced allocations to local partners to deliver longer-term move-on accommodation. More than 3,300 new long-term homes for rough sleepers across the country have been approved, and this is backed by government, uh, minister, government investment of more than £150 million. So, as you can see, there is quite a lot that is being done on this issue, which we take very, very seriously indeed. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to close by taking a moment to celebrate the contribution men and boys make to our society. The member for Rother Valley talked about men and boys in his constituency feeling like they have been forgotten. It therefore seems opportune to celebrate our fathers and our sons, our brothers and our friends, and indeed colleagues this week, and the progress we have made in supporting them under this government. For example, since 2010, we have seen the introduction of shared parental leave, allowing mothers and fathers to share the highs and indeed the lows of caring for their new babies. This government is also committed to making it easier for fathers to take paternity leave, as set out in our 2019 manifesto. And subject to further consultation, we are committed to introducing measures to make flexible working the default for men and women, unless employers have good reason not to. As someone who only came back from maternity leave this year myself, I can tell you, Madam Deputy Speaker, that my husband was able to take paternity leave and it made my return to work uh, much easier, having two ministerial responsibilities as well as my work as a constituency MP. So this is a, uh, this is a policy that I'm very, very passionate about. Yes, I will give one. Just briefly, I just wondered, that's all very well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, but would the Minister also look to make it easier for absent fathers to actually have access to their children and, and to speed up the process through the family courts, which is often a tortuous one, which causes so much heartache for so many fathers. 
My honourable friend is right, and yes, this is something that I think we can look into. I also want to recognise the work that he has done to raise awareness of fathers who feel a sense of alienation from losing access to their children. He will be pleased to see that the draft statutory guidance to be issued under the Domestic Violence Bill currently recognises parental alienation as an example of coercive or controlling behaviour, no doubt in part to his representations on this issue. I would like to thank him and my honourable friend for Mansfield again for their tireless work on these issues and for securing this debate today. And I pay tribute to my honourable friend uh, for Mansfield for his vigorous campaign to support boys from white working class backgrounds. He raised many issues about the way the Equality Act is interpreted uh, as protecting groups when actually what it protects is characteristics which we all have. I think some of his questions, especially around whether we should have a Minister for Women, are above my pay grade, but I think this is something that I will definitely raise with the Minister for Women and Equalities and also with the, uh, with the Prime Minister on his behalf as well. But I want to assure him that the Commission I sponsor on Race and Ethnic Disparities is currently studying how we will improve outcomes for these boys in the towns and regions of our country. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the Equalities Whip, the member for Finchley and Golders Green, uh, who rarely gets a chance to speak these days as a whip, for his successful campaign to get the HPV cancer jab given to men and boys. We're very proud of the work that he has done. And um, in that I close, and I'm honoured to have taken part in today's debate on International Men's Day to mark the progress we've made and also to highlight what more needs to be done. Ben Bradley. Madam Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her response and for the work she's doing to get this equalities agenda right, and particularly the hub that she mentioned, which includes socio-economic and geographical factors for the first time, something I raised in Westminster Hall a few weeks ago and I'm, I'm very pleased about. Uh, welcome the Shadow Minister to her place uh, and also thank the, the member for Glasgow East for, for talking about reaching out to our loved ones at this very difficult time. Uh, a huge thank you I should also pay to the member for Shipley. I'm very sorry I only got three minutes. Uh, to speak today because he is uh, you know, equally responsible uh, as I for bringing this debate forward today. That's a great shame, um, but a huge thank you for him. And he gets half of the credit, at least, that colleagues have paid to me uh, in the chamber today. Uh, I'd like to thank all colleagues for their thoughtful contributions. I haven't got time to go through them all, but shadow ministers have uh, some very moving and heartfelt ones. Um, International Men's Day uh, is, is one day that we celebrate annually, but it's not a conversation just for uh, one day. It's a chance to raise uh, great role models and huge challenges, things that we can do every day in this House in uh, the very priv privileged position that we hold. Uh, the public discourse that I mentioned, the negative attitudes pervade uh, every day. Um, the support that uh, men and boys need uh, is needed every day and is available every day, and we should all be helping uh, men to reach out uh, to seek that help uh, and continue to raise uh, the issues that we've discussed today, so many around health, mental health, suicide uh, and our, our services uh, in this House at every opportunity, not just on International Men's Day, but when uh, this day has long gone, uh, every chance that we can. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. What an excellent debate and accomplished in less than one hour. Uh -huh. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Siobhan McDonough. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I've lost count of the number of times that I have spoken in this House about the future of St Helier Hospital. Time and time again, the hospital has been hurled headfast into turbulence, with countless consultations coated in fancy branding, repeatedly asking my constituents whether they want their hospital to keep its A&E, critical care and maternity services. 